Yeah. Okay. How's, how's everybody been? Good. Good. Uh, I'm going to my computer. I think we hear you now. A little bit. Yeah. 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 Hear you. We hear you. Testing one, two, three. Can you yes. hear us? Yes. All right. Audio just kicked on. Oh Excellent. my goodness. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Good. So we're here. Yeah. I, I have been struggling the last two weeks. I got really sick, um, Aww. sicker than I've been in years and years and years. I was surprised actually. And, uh, so just uh, over the last two days, I've started to feel normal and my energy oh, coming wow. back. Yeah. So it was a rough couple of weeks. I pushed through and had to still work and, um, was so tired, uh, resting a lot and yeah, I had fever for a few days. Yeah, it was nasty. Aww. But I'm better now. I'm glad to hear I'm sorry. it. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry you're feeling bad. And I'm glad that you're feeling better. Yeah, I, I understand what you mean um, or how you feel because that's rough. And I, it actually took me a long time to figure out um, the difference between um, feeling ill and the after effects of feeling ill. And right. Now I explain that to people and they're like, I, I don't know what you mean. Like I I'm better now. Like, I don't know why I'm exhausted and, and tired all the time. It's like, cause your body was like on overdrive for the last two weeks. So yeah, you know, it, it kind of makes sense in that, like a mechanical, mm -hmm. a mechanical way. And that's, that could be like, some people don't understand that. And um, yeah, I think that all just comes with, you know, more experience, but yeah, I'm I'm glad that you're feeling better. And I know sometimes the recovery process afterwards is a little bit more difficult. You're yeah. just like, uh, yeah, it's like I wish am I, I gonna... just yeah. yeah, it's like the whole recovery pro process afterward. I'm always like, I wish I had just died. <laughs> it's kind of like a, a mind trip, you know, because you start to worry if you're gonna feel better again you know you're gonna it's my yeah. meant this brain fog gonna go away you know yeah absolutely right so then the, the when you start to feel crisp and sharp again it's like really good <laughs> so uh, so will hasn't popped in yet let me see if he's responding well, he's i think he's waiting on 3 3 p.m so how are the other two britneys you how are you guys <laughs> yeah, do you want to go, Brittany? You were here first. <laughs> okay, well, I've been okay. I've just been really busy. Um, I think we always wish that uh, we had more time to devote to all the things that we enjoy more. <laughs> and so yeah. I am able to really do that just because we've been really grinding really hard, but for good reason. And and everything is on the up and up and taking care of life. Um, so that's really good. So. Not really much else, though. It's kind of been, honestly, like a daze or a blur. Like, I don't know that I've stopped since last time we spoke is kind of how I feel. Oh, Me wow. too, honestly. Um, uh -oh. I haven't gotten sick yet, but yeah, I've been going hard too. And uh, not a lot of downtime or like right. space to take. And so, yes, yeah, I find myself getting getting more irritable versus like, yay, I'll put on like my best face for like customers and stuff. And then I'm like, I get home and I'm like, I just want quiet. Can you guys stop yelling? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After right? working, working like all day, kids. it is, it is hard to have that emotional capacity for the rest yes. of our lives. Oh yeah. 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 It's hard. Uh, well, Will is, uh, is in the waiting room. Cool. We're ready to bring him on in. All right, let's, All right. Uh, let's start. Yeah, we have a special guest. We're inviting a boy to the girls' club. <laughs> right, there's a... Hey, Will Keller. What's up, ladies? Hi, Hi Will. Well, How's welcome. it going? Yeah, we're good. Welcome oh, to, to the girls' club. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, welcome to the girls' club, Will. You're the first boy we're <laughs> letting you do the girls club i guess excellent um, it, it's an honor yeah imagine we're like in the tree house or something you know, hanging perfect out. that's that's where i'm at all the time in my head <laughs> that works out great what yeah. what episode yeah. is this for you 
for you ladies? I think this might be four. Four. Number four. Cool. Number four. Awesome. Yep. Um, in the first three episodes, we were just doing some kind of, I guess, preliminary talks and it's very casual and keeping it kind of real. Sweet. That's what it's so, all about. I love seeing it. And um, so, okay. Thanks everybody for coming and watching this video today. Girls Club number four. And today we've got all of our ladies and a special guest, Will Keller, who is a uh, onegreatnetwork.com presenter, as well as he's got a website, willkeller.com. You can find him on various platforms. Go check out his website to see more about him. And today we're going to be talking about, well, it's February, so we're, we're going to be talking about the meaning of love. So the the three standards I keep to of love, agape, philos, and eros. So the true meaning of love and what these three things mean. And we're going to go into it a little bit. So before we really start, does anybody have any notes or um, thoughts about that before we really get into it? No, oh, I'm <laughs> along for the ride. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so I, think I can go on, Brittany. No, I just said I think we should just jump right in. I read a uh, a lot of what you were bringing today, and I I think we should just go there and let it flow. All right, right on. So, um, I'm going to see if I can do this. Can you see that? Yes. I can move this so I can see it. That's soon. Okay. All right. We're, we're seeing a Microsoft uh, ad. There we go. There we go. No one okay, wants to pay for delayed. that. <laughs> I'm like, no. All right. So these are some of my notes that I've taken in the past. So um, I'm just going to jump into our first form of love called agape love which I like to usually start with that. Um, and I would simply put this as the love of knowledge and all that is in creation and just like the care that comes with that. So, uh, Will, we asked you to come in today because we really wanted your input on how you how you would define this this type of love, the agape love. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, agape, uh, that's how I pronounce it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's the correct form. This comes from the Greek tradition. Um, so it's ancient. It was kind of co-opt into the Bible and Christianity. So a lot of people that are aware of this term know it from uh, the passages of, uh, I believe it's um, John and Paul, where they use agape, and it, they're using it in the correct definition, but let's explore this, right? This is cosmic love. Uh, it might even be good to kind of talk about what love is. I mean, you know, it's February. This term gets thrown around a lot. Um, I define love as far as in its purest form. It is the force of creation. It is the, the will of creation that is uh, the force, the intelligent force that is animating everything and is uh, and pushing forward life in general. So to live is an act of love, an act of divine love. Um, and of course, there's many forms like you've talked about, eros, uh, philia, philos, um, and uh, agape as well, which we can, I think it's kind of good to dive into those because um, we can kind of analyze the types of love in the modern world and we can see where the blockage and the um, the feedback loop stands. A lot of people are stuck in that that eros, which there's nothing, nothing necessarily uh, negative about that. But being stuck at that level of awareness and that level of consciousness 
absolutely is going to have negative effects, especially in the aggregate and the collective of the, of the human species. When we get to uh, agape, yes, this is love in its purest form. It is the, the true will of creation, cosmic love, the love for truth, the love for the, the governing dynamics, nature, right? This is what agape is. And to have a human being <clears throat> align themselves to the pure form of agape, what it really means, it means that you are embodying um, your thoughts, emotions, and actions into unity consciousness. So where we have eros is the romantic, erotic, lustful, uh, sexual type of love, right? But this is driven by the lowercase will, our egoic pleasures and desires, motives, right? Um, and then we move up to philia or philos, uh, which is just the love for human beings, for humanity, right? That's good. But being stuck there is also um, at the level of awareness from the lowercase will, the egoic will. When you get to agape, you are, you recognize the creative intelligence that truth is as nature. And this puts you in a whole different category, especially from perception, because now you're, you're facilitating yourself, your own operation, your own thoughts, emotional, uh, internal ecology to align your behaviors to the truth of of nature and creation <clears throat> so that's that's how i define agape cosmic love the true will of creation uh and when you're serving the truth when you're aligned in agape um you are also serving humanity and serving the self as well this is in the positive context um so you know we can we can go down many different roads so that's my initial spiel. Yeah. yeah. I, I, Sarah, go ahead. Go ahead, Leslie. Well, I was just thinking about the two pillars, you know, of care and non-aggression and self-defense, right? As both being expressions of love. And I'm not sure where, you know, maybe they fit in on all three levels, right? Where we can, um, you know, from our care, protect, um, and defend our eros or our philos or in the larger sense of like protecting the truth, you know, for all of humanity. Uh, and I was thinking about there maybe being a feminine and a masculine aspect. When I think of like divine love, I think of sort of an infinite kind of a love that is ever renewing that doesn't have an end that is sort of all accepting and compassionate. Um, and I'm wondering how you guys might think that fits in to the, any of these categories. I, uh, I noticed when both Sarah and Will was, were explaining agape or that's how I pronounce it, I guess. Um, I think I may have been seeing that as the love for, humanity I've not actually explored in my studies the form of or the word eros um, I just knew it as like sexual um, lustful more physically intimate maybe um, or even the thelos or thelio um, but it was very very interesting to hear those perspectives yeah I'm, I'm open to your guys's thoughts I'd also like to discuss uh unconditional love at some point if you guys would be up for it <laughs> mm, good one absolutely uh i'll chime in real quick on what leslie said because this is very yeah. important um the <clears throat> the masculine and feminine and 100 percent it applies to all forms of love healthy forms of love but especially agape there is a masculine and feminine and this would be the you know the true highest union of these two energies these two polarities of energy the masculine would be persistence and the feminine would be care right so when you're serving the truth in that 
agape, you are active. You are taking action. You are not passive. So under, for an example, understanding the, the tyranny and the injustice that is going on uh, on this planet um, and not taking action, then for sure you're not embodying that agape love. Now, the feminine aspect of care, this is the nurturing aspect of the, the love force itself, right? So you have to be persistent and care to take action, care for truth, care for humanity, um, and for what is right. And that's all ultimately what agape is. It's the care for <clears throat> what is right and acting on it. Yeah, absolutely. I would, I mean, I would agree with all that. And I would only add that, like, I, I kind of seem to view it because there's the balance of the masculine and feminine. If you have actual healthy, true care and love for everything and, you know, that exists because it's part of you anyway. Um, and the masculine I would see as the, is the pushing the force and the feminine as the side of the balance that knows when to pull back and see the full picture you know and i i think you have to have both if you're going to 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 do that and um so i have like a couple of the examples i have here is one of them is i see a lot of it on the internet especially because it's just rampant wild free for all of whatever people want to just say but i see it out in the real world too, too where there's so much division and uh everybody's butting head, heads that there is no you know love for mankind there's no love for you know there's none none of that brotherly love there's none of that community love everybody is just at each other and when you have that, it doesn't seem like you can get, you, you can't really get to the stage where you're like, okay, well, you know, you're, you are a pain in my ass, but you know, I love you guy. So you can't, it, it seems like we can't get in that space on a larger scale. And maybe this is what the key is to how we're crumbling as a community global human family so i mean and like my my other example was that an ex a, a good example that i think of as agape love is when um we were in the revolutionary war and our founding fathers knew like look we can't keep going on the way we've been going on and we need to create something new or at least attempt to at least try to and like i you know they they had the ideas in their head they loved their family they loved their neighbors you know even though maybe they didn't always get along <laughs> but they had that and they wanted a better world for the future and i think that was the point that they had and that i think is a really good example of that that they came together despite of whatever differences they may or may not have had. And I don't know, I just, I feel like that may be part of the key that a lot of us are missing. So any thoughts? I just think that, um, I think it all kind of marries into the other. Um, just have to speak for myself personally. If, if, if I'm not seeking and driving towards that love for truth, um, then I'm doing a disservice when I'm then loving and caring for my children and my family. Um, so if I don't have that big key factor, it's just, I'm not, I'm not doing as well. Um, so yeah. but I about it kind of before Will came in too, um, that everything's just been kind of like, I've been in like a daze in a zone, just doing all the things I need to do to provide, um, and not really doing the things that are on my heart, which is more geared towards truth and great work. So trying to find the balance between those is really important, um, but they all have to come together. And you're right. It's a lot of that missing out here. Mm -hmm. so. 
Yeah, I think, you know, it's it's well, worth mentioning that people lose their way on the path of love when they have been uh, wounded or chronically stressed, right? What is it that knocks people off the path of love? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's a great question. Like what straight, what pulls people away from it so far that they can't see, they can't see anything in front of them. But I do think that the act of going, you know, maybe not necessarily working out with your community, but if you can start with yourself and your the inner workings of your your inner home, I think that's where everybody has to start. Otherwise, you can't go outside of that. Absolutely. Any any thoughts, anyone on that? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I just agree. I always need to come in and recenter before working outwards. I think the home, not just, I mean, we we are our foundation, you know, like the, the root. Um, from which we spring forth from and our home is is a big part of that as well 100 percent. you I know it's it's important. interesting uh one thing i i love doing in in my studies uh especially in the mystery traditions it's seeing how the western philosophies or or mystery traditions correlate and correspond even to the eastern um, some of the Eastern philosophies, <clears throat> they had their own levels of love as well, and it was used in the, the, the chakra system, right? So the cosmic energy comes through the crown, but it starts at the, the root chakra, and that moves its way up. And as so when you're in that eros, that erotic, romantic love, you are you are rooted in your operating your level of awareness and operating from the root and sacral chakras and then once you you move up then you get to the solar plexus which is more of the philos philia and then you get to the heart which is really the epicenter and it you know it's a flowering but even moving from there going into the the agape the agape is the opened heart center with the higher chakras opened as well and that is when you get into you know wisdom it's not just knowledge it's wisdom with the care as well opened and then that is the the agape energy um and you know we can see a lot of people nowadays and again you know just in the modern age it's not easy because people are kind of rooted in those lower chakras and rooted in the reptilian mind of just surviving um so that is hard but still like you ladies were saying it's internal it starts inside and for someone to set foot on the path you have to simplify it and you have to start with the foundational you know principles and and um and attributes and work your way up but ultimately a true seeker is one that is seeking that agape love that's what it is and trying to harmonize with it and it will always be rooted in truth and freedom it dawns on me that agape love can exist within eros within erotic love and within philos, brotherly love, and that maybe it is when ag agape is present that <clears throat> all levels of love could sort of transform into something uh, greater, you know, that empowers um, those different types of unions and affiliations. You know, um, it's uh, Mark Passio once uh, in one of his interviews talked about you know, the, the love of a couple, let's say, you know, a partnership, and that what really makes that love uh, very special and vital is not that they're just looking at each other, but that they are united looking towards truth. And on that path together, um, you know, with agape love, mm -hmm. and that multiplies the power, right? if we are in partnership with our lover or our brothers and our sister, and we're all facing the truth and the love of freedom and truth and knowledge, like how powerful could that be? 100%.
Yeah, absolutely, Leslie. I think you got to have all three, work on all three to have a good, healthy balance. Yeah, mm -hmm. and truth truth is absolutely vital too because if if it's false and it's not correct, then you don't have the information that you need to make truly informed decisions in your lives. That that result will always yield results that are not um, correct. And so truth is, is extremely important along the way, I feel. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, Brittany. That's a great point because we can look at, you know, the, the new age movement. Where oh, yeah. They, Got stuck in that for a while. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I can absolutely relate. But, you know, a lot of people in the New Age movement, they, they understand oneness, which that's, yes. that's, what, that's what agape is, right? It is that macrocosmic love, that oneness. But yet, a lot of them don't have the knowledge and understanding that is grounded and rooted in the here and now. They'll preach about the present moment and the here and now, but they don't understand what is actually going on. Or and how to yield is, the moment, yeah. Sure, absolutely. Um, so it's understanding the natural law, the, the universal forces, but also understanding what the hell is going on in, on the ground, in the here and now, in the present moment, and then doing what is right. So we can kind of see that there's this bastardized version in the New Age movement where it's just all about the oneness and negate the the true, accurate present moment of what is going on. So they very much focus on just the macro um, scope of of the universe. Well, we're all connected. Everything's one. So it doesn't matter, which they, you know, they take on a form of moral relativism and inaction yes. as well. So yeah. it's there there's a light and dark to you know to all these topics that we're talking about but there's also there a, a a pure um you know when you get to agape the eros like you were saying Leslie absolutely it it trickles down um and they serve each other in uh symbiosis mm -hmm. and like the love of self if you cut off the top of the tree it becomes um self profiting right devoid of truth or other forms of higher love right it becomes more of a de facto satanism when the love of self is is cut off from from agape love for example and so but yet if you deny the self and just think about the oneness then we're uh cutting off the roots so there is a love lo we're loving oneself and doing the self work is really an important part of um also embracing like all selves all people that are part of this greater purpose you know an agape love that makes sense any thoughts on that yeah absolutely i think that that's all important i agree with that leslie but I, I just want to bring up the, um, since it, you know, February, it's Valentine's Day, everybody's in the, the mode of that. Uh, I think another big problem with how the concept of love is being diverted into the wrong directions is just false, with false love, false care, empty love, doing things like I mean, you know, some people, they just think that you only, you know, produce a, a physical form of your love, like candies and chocolate or whatever, or uh, flowers or whatever, that one time of the year, February 14th, when it comes around and you're obligated to show that you love somebody. And this, like, I, I look at this holiday and I'm like, it's just so empty. And it's just, it, it's an empty holiday. And, you know, I think that that's a, that's a thing that we could all do every single day at the same level, um, including Valentine's Day, and it shouldn't be this obligation. So um, do you guys have any, you know, thoughts about that? And then we can move on if you like. I just agree with you. Um, <laughs> Valentine's Day or 
we've talked about this so much, like the Gregorian holidays really just drive me mad. Um, <laughs> although it's really great for Ubering, that's besides the point. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we we talk about it all the time, you know, when those things and Christmas and family and gatherings and then Valentine's Day, it's like, we really do. We just, we love deeply every day. I'm so fortunate to have that partner that Leslie was speaking about, that Euros love that is just profound and in truth 100%. And, and uh, it changed everything for me when, when that union came together um, and five years in now, and we're on the same trajectory with things. And it's, it's like, it's a huge deal, but there's no chocolates or there's no monetary thing, anything that could ever define, ever, ever define it, ever. So I agree. Yeah. I, that's beautiful. Yeah. I think yeah. of I think of the uh these holidays, like the Hallmark holidays, as being like portals into the dark side, you know, into mind control, where if we're just mindlessly, you know, um following the rules of the holiday and doing buying the cards and buying the this or the that that we are really um not fully directing our own minds towards truth so you know i tend to really under you know under i'm not excited about these holidays too much um other than i think about perhaps the deeper meaning of that's being like overlaid, you know, because most of the holidays are a cover for something that maybe is deeper and has deeper meaning underneath in terms of natural cycles or, um, you know, deeper pagan, you know, acknowledgements of, of changes of seasons or things like that. So I think that's an important point, you know, and how we're, are we mentally attached and do, are we caught up in guilt or obligation or is, you know, are we doing what we're doing because we are choosing it with a free mind? Right. Yeah, and the conditioning of like, you know, I spent so many years really doing all those things, right. And expecting on Valentine's day and doing the Christmas. And I spent a lot of years doing that. Um, so to come into the union that I'm in, he taught me so much. My husband, Brett, um, he taught me a great deal and it and it changed everything. But of course, I went through that phase where I had to come away from the conditioning and away from all the things that I thought were and, and you know, to realize that they really were never anything. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I always keep thinking, <laughs> I think we should just buy a calendar and like rearrange all the holidays on it and like mark it out like, no. Valentine's Day is now, now like, mm -hmm. you know, July 28th or whatever. And just like mix it all up and like send that to like a random address. Like there's your calendar, you know, <laughs> I think there's a lot of like emotional attachment too. like, it's difficult to let go of something that's always been this staple. And one of those is the yearly calendar, you know, and what the calendar says, what day it is, you know, like it's National Donut Day or whatever. And it, and they just keep adding like random things to it. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with all of everything you guys said. So and if you want to move on, I thought maybe you could go a little bit more into maybe it's a two parter. Will, if you could talk a little bit more about Eros and Philos. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll say something real quick on holidays and how they're celebrated in, in the modern age. Um, I think it's really misdirection from the natural rhythm of life on an energetic level. Um, you know, most of these holidays, once you, you do your research and you educate yourself, they're always, uh, most of them are rooted in natural cycles in nature. Um, and to keep keep people ignorant and disconnected from nature and the, the flow of energy. So I call it the, the rhythm of life. Um, and to ultimately keep people, well, ignorant, but rooted in the, the lower mind, right? The lower self, the egoic self, that's um, that where e it's ego dominant. And again, th there is a healthy ego, right? There is no such thing in this, incarnation as killing your ego can't happen 
but you can have a healthy being in the world where your ego and your higher self are in union um, and when we see something like eros it absolutely is rooted in that base level of consciousness where our uh, the animalistic uh, instinctual attributes of the human being are in overdrive and behind the wheel and they're controlling it valentine's day is a great example where you know there's a lot of control and narcissism around this holiday where you don't love me unless you buy me this bracelet or you know you have sex with me or whatever it, it whatever the case may be and this is certainly what's going on around this holiday so it's from that ego sense of you need to validate your your love for me um and again that's just keeping people rooted in in the ego in that lower self um when you get to philos that brotherly love right again it, it's the love for the familiar for the family for your brothers and sisters on a human level and also your intermediate family absolutely but the agape like you were saying, Leslie, it does trickle down. When you're in agape, you are also, you have the healthy eros and the healthy philos as well. Um, so as far as philos, I mean, again, who was it? I think, Brittany, you brought up unconditional love, which yeah. is really good. That's a really good question. Because again, yeah. the New Age movement, it's all about unconditional love. Love so, is unconditional, and I, absolutely, yes. we could talk about this. Go ahead. Well, I'm I'm so inspired. I'm so glad you brought that up, and maybe I'm so open to your guys' thoughts if you think differently. Um, but I found that, or for me personally, I don't know that unconditional love exists, and the reason why I say that is because I've just found, like you know, there's people who hate everybody except maybe their kid or their dog. But they, they love their kid because it's their kid. It's not somebody else's. And that in and of itself is a condition. They love their animal, their dog, because they've created a bond and it's it's theirs. And so that is the condition. You know, if it was somebody else's dog, they wouldn't care as much. So I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on that because they're all about, you're right, that within the New Age movement, unconditional love, this and that. And I always felt you know, a general love for others, but a lot of people also will move forward with unconditional love and have like zero boundaries and, and get walked all over. I definitely have fallen into that uh, in a couple of different relationships. So yeah, if you guys want to share your thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Well, real quick, I'll just chime in because what you were explaining is philos. This is this would be the negative context or the dark philos or philia, right? Where, and we see this because you know it's it's me me me. It's a solipsistic type of world, um, and this is what the dark philos is. It's all about my tribe. Screw everyone else. It's all about my family. Screw everyone else. This type of of mentality. Um, which is just the dark essence of that, really in name only. Like pedophilia, right? There's a dark side of that. Yeah, it, it's it's in name only, meaning it's not it's not real love. Yeah. It's not it's the lack of love. So, you know, they it's we I can say, you know, the negative side of philos, but what I'm really saying is that the love is not even there. They're just claiming something, but what that is 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 more about fear, control, coercion. It's a distortion of love. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Absolutely. I would agree with both Brittany and Will there that um yeah, with with philos you can get into the toxic side of it where it's about ownership. You know, like, I love my kid because it's mine instead of I am the steward of this, like, human being that I created from authentic love. You know, it's it's a completely different, like, I, I mean, I would feel the same way about, like, unconditional love. It's like, well, that means that even, say, you were to go out and commit a heinous murder, but your brother has unconditional love for you and would not try and stop you and instead would back you up, you know, like, so that kind of thing. So yeah, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes me think about like, um, they also say things like, you know, we shouldn't judge. So I think about this, but we do judge. I think that's our tool of discernment, right? So I think it kind of ties into the same. There are conditions. There's always conditions. Um, and that, and natural law too. It's things are going to be. They're going to fall where they're supposed to fall. So absolutely. Like I, th I think judgment it. is an important part of how we we do things. Like where they do say, you know, don't don't judge. Like the only thing I don't think you should judge about is a book's cover. So mm -hmm. <laughs> read read every, every book you can get at. <laughs> Everything else, like judgment, Jen is a way we use that. Right. It's like philos love is is tribal love. And, you know, there's a way that tribe or community or family unit can be uh, <clears throat> strong and be be a positive, you know, uh, force in the world that can help create security, identity. <clears throat> At the same time, it can have a, a, a danger to it if we become too attached to our tribe in exclusion of or judgment of anything, anyone who's different, right? And not recognize that we're all one family, ultimately, the fami the larger familial unit of humanity, right? And right. agape. And um, I was, I was thinking about unconditional love. And I thought about this before that 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 it's being um presented as like oh we're all one don't judge love everybody yeah and and i think that that's that's false i think that that is an attempt to be god right you know because in a sense you know as i think of god this all that is this energy of all that 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 level of 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 a perspective of all that is is has perhaps a capacity or whatever God is to to love, to give grace, to to accept all that is, and in, which includes wrongdoing. But as humans living in this world, I think it's actually dangerous to pretend that we are God in that widest capacity, because we are capable of of compassion and forgiveness and yet there seems to be um a need to have some kind of boundary around which you know you know that that has a value system around life you know that that does involve some kind of judgment of right and wrong and in a way there are certain conditions because if we accept someone to do a heinous heinous act because it you know it's just unconditional love right <clears throat> is that really you know maybe love is really about stopping that i you know what do you i i agree i mean there is no such thing as unconditional love even the the will of creation it's conditional love the condition is nothing is above the law natural law and it applies to to all of us so we are going to have consequences for our behaviors that is a condition um the or you could look at it as the unconditional part would be the gift of free will where you can choose right or wrong but still the condition is there's going to be a consequence for that 100 percent um, so, yeah, I definitely think that the unconditional love, the way that it's it's kind of promoted in the New Age movement, it's very uh, it, it's not it doesn't align with truth like um, unhealthy. and it is part of solipsism. Yeah, 100 yeah. percent. Sorry I mean, if you hear my rooster Henry crowing, too. He's like right up against our door. So I don't know what y'all are getting on that. <laughs> oh, I want to hear him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, you know, we could you could choose to live out of harmony with the natural law and there is a condition you know there, there's cause and effect and then you know you're probably going to come back for another life and maybe another yet to 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 figure it out right that's sort of the unconditional like infinite looping you know that that someone might be on in this big picture of multiple lives you know, but yet, what are we here for in this plane, this three-dimensional existence where we have 
natural law. It, it is from my point of view to, to learn to harmonize with it, right? So that we can uh, be united in this agape love and really understand our full capacity as humans, you know? Yeah. That's why and, it's and important to under, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, no, go ahead, Will. I was saying that's why it's good to understand the larger and lesser ar arcanas, body of knowledge, right? Because the all is mind, that is love. The existence, life itself is an act of love. Um, and then yeah, the sure. lack of love is the, the involutionary, the fear-based consciousness, which is what you what we call fear, which is really the lack of love. So, but Ooh, understanding the macro like in the micro is extremely important. People get lost in you know and uh, diluted within these larger concepts, and they relate them and correlate them to the micro, and that is you know a cul-de-sac for awareness. Yeah, I would, that's that's what I was gonna say. Hey, well, I was gonna add that in, um, and, and this. So I always tell people like what you guys are all talking about, um, there are consequences. And I, I try to get people's head because I work more like with the community in real time. And we talk about stuff like this all the time. And, and I try to get their heads wrapped around the idea. It's like that, you know, because we we're so trained to think that certain words only have certain kinds of contexts and whatever. But I'm like, no, a word has a definition. And I, I try to get them to understand that, like, it doesn't, like, what you do in this life is what creates, and whether that is a good thing, a good thing you create, or a negative thing that you create, if it's a good thing, you're going to get a positive consequence, if it's a negative thing, you're going to get a negative consequence, this is cause and effect, and, and I kind of equate it to, like, they're all part of the same one mind, we're all fractions of that higher source, god or spirit or whatever people want to call it and we're just here as the physical representation of that in the physical with the power of action and this is where you know this is the whole boots on the ground thing this is how i view that it's like you have to be here and that means if you have to like come back over and over and over again until eternity then that's i mean maybe like I kind of look at it, it's like a video game almost. Only there are, only it's like the real life version of Sims or something like that. And there are consequences to every single thing you do, good or bad. And um, so I try to, I, I try to kind of go by that when I'm explaining it to others. And you know, usually they can see it that way, but it's very difficult to get out of this idea that. You know, if I say there's a consequence, then it's always negative. And it isn't always negative. Sometimes it's a positive one. Sometimes it's in a way that you didn't expect at all. And I think that is the uh, spontaneous element of our reality, too. You know, that's the, you know, you know, something is stepping in to maybe kind of do something spontaneous and quirky where maybe you needed a push in something, you know, and I, I've seen that kind of thing happen before as well. Oh. Seen it happen in my own life. Not like a, you know, in a religious way, more like, you know, maybe at my high self going, no, this way. And kind of shoving me into one direction that I hadn't even thought of before. So, but I think, you know, our subject that we're talking about today, that authentic love is the core to all of that. It's the key. Yeah, I'll add, I'll just add the the importance of self awareness. You know, doing our inner work, having learning the skills to regulate emotion, because it's off emotion is all interwoven with these concepts of love. Although emotion itself is not love, I think as we're defining these aspects of love, and so really knowing yourself and being able to be the master of your thought, feeling, and action mastering your emotion, uh, healing your trauma, knowing your motivations um, and your worldviews, really important to be able to kind of like tease away all of that stuff that gets in the way of our true embodiment of 
of love. That's a great point. (laughs) Great point, because so many people, this is why conversations like this are extremely important on this topic, right? Like, what is love? And so many people equate it to, uh, oh, it's just chemicals. It's just certain types of emotions. um, And there's all this different piecemeal when really it's a it's an embodiment. It's all encompassing. It's holistic in its pure, authentic form. Um, so, you know, negating the action and the behavior aspect is is doing it injustice. I love yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we were just it, it was in the knitting room. We were talking about a thing that happens called, called a negging. Do you know what that is? I've heard of it, but I didn't care enough to remember. <laughs> yeah, so I I heard about it years ago, and negging is a great example of inauthentic, narcissistic, empty, dead go love. Look it up. And um, it, it's usually something done by people who are either, you know, just totally like dumb animals like beast consciousness bottom of the barrel not really you know they're they're so like enwrapped in like you know tiktok and you know hip-hop videos or whatever about giant rear ends and stuff like that like that's like their whole personality that they've wrapped around themselves and um narcissists and like people who like to have controlling power over a couple um but you know it, it could be anybody who does it, I guess. It's just, it's the act of, um, it's a pickup tactic. So it's like the act of going up to say, I, I think usually men do it. I mean, maybe women do it, but I think men usually do it. They'll go up to a woman, they will break her down and insult her just to build her back up again with some sort of small compliment to bring her back up to be you know they'd say something like kind of like are you sure i don't know if that dress is working for you and oh but you have real pretty eyes and like you know it's it's shit like that and it's it's this form of you know i I don't know what it is and i guess it works to some degree but that is emotional manipulation right Yes. I'm familiar. I'm familiar yeah. with exactly what you're talking about. I myself back in my, you know, in my day didn't apply those type of manipulation tactics, but had new people that did. And most of the time they would say it very facetious or sarcastic, but mm-hmm. insult and then a compliment. And for some reason, you know, certain women just ate that up. It's I think it's goes with the programming and conditioning of the bad boy type of mentality um which again you know this goes to what leslie was saying about um understanding truth itself and ultimately self-knowledge right and working on yourself where you're at a certain level where then and if more people do that then you come together with a partner and that should amplify that progress and that uh, that energy as well. So many people are are broken and misguided and not working on themselves and in a state of uh, unconscious uh, awareness, and then they come together, um, which you know keeps going. I think this is the, the majority of relationships nowadays. Mm-hmm. And then add that to parenting, and we have a society <laughs> based in slavery and mm-hmm. and uh, and control and ignorance. Yeah, mind games, really. Yeah, correct. which is why great work is so important I, I, how could you I, all this wisdom how could you possibly I couldn't go back to wanting chocolates and roses yeah. mm. I mean no way you could possibly want to go back after you've actually felt experienced known your 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 living trivium you know these things and, and your life is embodying it and you're teaching it to your children and and you realize that 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 what was before isn't even a fraction of of the kind of love that you now know. Yeah, Brittany, oh, absolutely. Like I, I couldn't go back. No I way. Go back. Yeah, not in a million. Years. 
Well, I kind of feel bad because I get chocolates all the damn time, especially on Valentine's Day, and I like it. (laughs) I'll enjoy them chocolates, especially like once a month. I'll keep them and eat them. But (laughs) but I honestly I feel very blessed because I've never had a relationship that was so consistently nurturing and loving. And so it's just like an extra day to get me more than the usual chocolate bar or something that's picked up for me. (laughs) And and there's no Leslie. I just, I, I don't think it means it's, it's bad or negative to give a gift or to receive a gift. You if know? it's coming from a loving and genuine yeah. place versus right. like an obligation. Exactly. Right. Or yeah. expectation. So, yeah. That's like right. Not having the wisdom and then coming into it and knowing it and experiencing that real, what it really is. It's just, it's just not something you can reverse. So yeah. having the conversation about it. And doing the great work and teaching natural law and those things, um, it's of the utmost importance to share. It's a gift. It's a gift. Yeah. And I, I can't, there's no way I could just hold it to myself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, you know people that, that want to celebrate Valentine's Day, they the issue comes in, uh, just tradition in general, right? It, it's all about the context and the knowledge that one one possesses when it comes to this kind of uh these kind of traditions right you have awareness the awareness exactly just like one of my personal mentors which is Brittany's uh partner brian (laughs) um a principle of universal law natural law is awareness reveals choice yes so as you increase your awareness the the choices increase as well and as your choices increase pathways and doors open to higher awareness so you know i just want to say that as far as tradition itself the problem is a lot of people are you know celebrating holidays and pulling out credit cards to buy a diamond ring and they don't they don't have that knowledge they're in that state of ignorance and confusion um you know in that lower self just following following what they were programmed to do societally instead of come from a genuine more of a genuine and pure or pure place there we go (laughs) a lower tunnel vision of awareness which makes a cul-de-sac and a tunnel of choices which that is someone that is implementing and playing out programming and conditioning yeah and then it's why black friday is so important i mean so popular right oh yeah i hate hundreds and thousands of dollars (laughs) yeah it gives away our energy our our money our time our our focus in a way that is feeding some dark forces. So it's like thinking about how you um, give, what you give, and is it feeding Satanism? You know, is it feeding the commercialism and, you know, the greed and the insecurity of the world? Or is it actually feeding and, um, enhancing you know a true pure love you know yeah um yeah Leslie absolutely it's like I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with people celebrating holidays I have no real problem with it my only part of it is when it becomes like inauthentic and but I think like we talked about this before I think during our Christmas or New Year's episode where it's like these you know the traditions I, I feel like tradition should be an inner thing. So it, it's more like, what are the particular traditions you and your family develop naturally in your own inner home? Not just these like uh, robotic traditions that everybody does this because that's just what everybody does, you know? Like, I mean, one of the things I would do in my house as a tradition, I guess, is Um, I will put my Christmas tree up the day after Thanksgiving and all of our decorations that we have are either, you know, old school, like family heirlooms from like sixties and seventies or something we made or something we picked out together. No plastic, you know, well, some they're plastic, most of them, (laughs) Mm. but, um, you know, they're not these big, you go into Walmart and it's this big old container of like, throw away plastic baubles that, you know, whatever, you know, what do you do with it? Collect it, you know, it's just, 
um, it doesn't have any real meaning because it's just, it's kind of an empty, it's like going along for everybody to do the same thing. So I think with Valentine's Day, it is good to have, if you have those kind of, you know, your, your, your energy goes where your attention flows. So if it's an inauthentic love, it's going to develop into that and it's going to develop into the negative consequences, you know, that realm. And if it's an authentic one, you're going to get positive ones from it. So, you know, like Brittany, like every Valentine's day, Brian gifts her with, you know, special gifts, which is great. And she and I think he probably does that all the time. He does. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Valentine's day, like, you know, the funniest gift I ever get, you know, the best gift I could get for Valentine's Day is when, like, other people are shocked that my husband forgets or hasn't, not really <laughs> forgets, but, like, doesn't think about it because we just are like that all the time anyway. It's another day. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, like, you get girls who are like, you don't know what's Valentine's Day? I lost track of the dates this year, too. So, so <laughs> we did here. But, you know, the thought was there, even though we were late. But Sarah, I wanted to mention you had said something about that authentic love. And if a relationship is built on inauthentic inauthenticity, that will eventually show up. And I'm not going to drop a name, but my last relationship actually started on a lie. And it was very, very fascinating because that lie didn't come up until we were back together for like two or three years. And ultimately because that was the foundation that that relationship was built on it totally crumbled it was built on a fracture it was built on something that was not rooted in truth and honesty and it completely fell apart and i just wanted to highlight that because i've actually seen that i've i've lived that <laughs> but yeah. i've also um found a relationship that is a lot more healthy um and we have things come up but we just, we handle it then and there on the spot. And um, we always end up feeling closer and finding a, a sense of resolve. But um, just since you mentioned that, I had to, I had to share personal experience because I have found that to be extremely true. Yeah, that's a good, really good example. Excellent um, point. It's like it's looking at when love. you start, you know, when you get involved and you start a new, you know, romantic relationship, What's the foundation, ba the foundation based upon? Like you were saying, Brittany, right? It was based on a lie, so it had a fractured foundation, which, you know, it doomed to fail, right? But yeah. um, someone understanding first principles, morality, natural law, truth, and has stepped onto that path and is doing that internal work to people, that's going to be a, a sound, firm foundation. And absolutely, um, that energy there can can proceed in a natural form and fashion and in a natural rhythm. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then from that solid foundation, raising children with the with the continued um, value of truth and you know, a, a true love, then that becomes an even wider and more solid foundation and multiply that, you know, the more people that are building. Absolutely. It might be like kind of the concept of the pay it forward mm -hmm. method, you know, and it's leading by example, like when your children see, like our, our children, mm -hmm. even if they don't um, acknowledge it really, or even mm -hmm. understand the terms or the information externally, mm -hmm. they see what's happening and they take that in. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times they construct who they are based off of how we conduct ourselves with others and with ourselves. Um, so I think it's important to, I mean, even if we don't have kids, even if you're somebody, you're not married and you don't have kids, that doesn't mean that you can't show that same kind of um, love or care or, you know, treatment towards others when you conduct yourself with proper awareness, with proper, well, I should say with a full rounded embodiment of love, then that shows. It rubs off into your community and the people in your community understand how you are going to be and it, it affects people. 
that way, even if you, if, even if you're not in a relationship, even if you don't have children to teach this to, you have children in your neighborhood who will see it happen. I mean, and, and they will absorb that in because they take in everything in their environment. So, yeah. yeah really good, Sarah. Right. You, you might Very be fun. a good time to bring the Wheel of Fortune card in. So, yeah. And, and, so, um, well, I did want to talk oh, about, pretty. so this was one of the part of the topic that Leslie brought in. The Irish and Scottish mm -hmm. goddess Bridget means the exalted one. Mm -hmm. And this was, mm -hmm. so Emmy, do you know more about it or mm -hmm. would you like to talk more about it? Well, in, a, in a simple way, she um, is an ancient, well, ageless uh, goddess mm -hmm. that is, um, often celebrated during the, the season of Imbolc, the time of Imbolc around February 1st, and, and is representing this time when in nature, the cycle of nature where the earth is starting to thaw, you know, and there's a hope and a feeling of winter is going to come to an end. And Bridget or Breedy is, um, she's the goddess of both fire or sun and also you know and with that energy the fire of the forge right the goddess of craftsmen and she's the the muse uh the goddess of poets and she represents the hearth you know in the home where uh sort of people gather for warmth and uh gather around the fire and <clears throat> warm up right and there, she's also there's also the well and so there's a a dissociation of water and the deep well of life so fire and water sustainer of life the bringing the the evolution of the sun you know into um towards spring yeah and love the, the artwork, imagery sorry yeah, the, <laughs> i was just looking art, at that's great the artwork comes from deviantart.com so you can anybody can go and, and and so everybody who may be listening not listening you can always go and see the description and I'll have all this information in there as well for you but you can go and check out deviantart.com and the artist is diddles 25 and this is the picture sh that she made what are you and doing? um I think that it's it, it's a nice picture I mean to just embody I think even February you know like everything that she's supposed to represent and that the things that she's attributed to you know in Ireland they do celebrate this day um I live there so they do bring up this day or some have heard but I think it's good art because I mean you've got you know the divine feminine here balanced um, with how she presents herself, she's got action with her amp hammer. She's got her her um, writing to utensil that is the you know what inspiration you can put that down. And then this part here, a little thatch cross here, is what I was most interested in because it reminded me of the Wheel of Fortune. It reminded me of the the lesser cross and the greater cross so the wheel of fortune this is the in the rider way tarot deck and you can see the greater cross and the lesser cross within it and i just thought that was an interesting thing and i don't know because i know the thatch thatch crosses have a certain type of meaning behind them it's a from what I understand, it's a protection thing. It is a like, an, you know, embodying protection of loved ones. But I wanted to know what you guys might think about the correlation it comes with the two crosses within the Wheel of Fortune. You've got the lesser cross and the greater cross. And what your guys' thought was on that. Will, do you have some Excellent. thoughts on this? 
Yeah, for sure. So I, I would see the the greater cross and the lesser cross as, as you know, meaning the macro and the micro. Um, and what's cool about in bulk and you know there are many other areas uh in the ancient past that celebrated this time i mean chinese new year was just february 10th so this is a time of coming out of the darkness of winter and now you know halfway towards spring so the light the fire working on oneself it's time to put what we worked on internally into the external world uh this is when many types of animals uh, you know, begin their, their mating season as well. So life is beginning as well. So, um, I would see, that's how I would see the crosses. Um, you know, a cross also symbolizes the four cardinal directions as well, North, East, South, West. Um, and so that's how I see it. The macro and the micro macro being nature, the planet itself slash the universe on cosmic level and then the internal as well the internal universe internal ecology so my main question is so this cross is you know like this so i i always kind of forget which cross is that the the lesser cross or the greater cross the one that uh, makes the x i know there's the x and there's the up and down so um, I always kind of forget. <laughs> There's also a zigzaggy shape, you know, to that Bridget's cross. And it and it's similar. I, I've seen it referenced as similar to the, the original meaning of the swastika, even, which is a very old symbol for prosperity and good fortune. It's the, um, the well-being, you know, that comes with the coming of spring and the knowing that you're planting seeds and, and you will have abundance. It's hopefulness. Um, you know, the, the, that wheel of fortune really symbolizes the passing of times and cycles and rhythms of which this is a, is one of those cross quarters, you know, in the beginning of February, that's, that's uh, just letting us remember that we're on this journey of change, uh, this rhythm of nature. Yeah. The wheel yeah, of I life. I like that you said that because sometimes when I'm feeling lost and I pull a tarot card like regarding work and career, I always kind of interpret it as, oh, it's whatever you want. Like it's the wheel. But I think I could look at that a little differently now. So I appreciate that interpretation from both you guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I can feel it. This this season, I've been really um, attuning to kind of my, the the weather, the rhythms of the weather. We're in um, California, we've been having a lot of rain, a lot of sort of darkness. And even with, so with the winter solstice and the sun starting to rise, there's still been a sense of it being in this sort of um, dark underworld, you know, um, kind of like the chrysalis you know, where it's things aren't quite ready, you know, even with the Gregorian New Year, that didn't really feel like n the new beginning for me. But this season right now, I kind of went through a, a purging, you know, a deeper like darkening of being sick. But now I'm feeling this natural energy towards creation again. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like about this image of a wheel is that we can start to tune into nature cycles. We can start to recognize the uh, elements, you know, that are represented in the four um, zodiac signs and the corners from, you know, the, the bull, the Taurus, the earth element and the Scorpio uh, eagle up, you know, and the water element and the air element of Aquarius and the Leo fire down below earth and fire. And, you know, how there's this um, movement, you know, where we're all uh, exposed and experiencing these various elements and energies. I see um, Wheel of Fortune, so it's from the Path of the Fool after the Hermit. Right. So it's like when 
when I see Wheel of Fortune, it's like we're in that hermit um, knowledge and we're, we've gone internally to find these things. And so that's the change is taking all that, all that we've found in the internal and then that knowledge is power only in action. So it's that it's that over. Um, and then even when it's reversed, if if the card comes reversed, I think is important too. It's not necessarily negative either. It's like um, there might be resistance, but maybe we're supposed to have resistance because because some things we need to resist to, right? Whatever it is, addiction or whatever it is, we need to have a resistant. But but in some way, good or bad, just like there's always a condition or a change or a consequence, where there is a change to come. So it's it's a really powerful card. Yeah. Mm. So I whenever yes. I pull the Wheel of Fortune card, I always think it's trying to just tell me to step back in consider a little longer before i start making assessments right. um, because i i think it is a knowledge-based card um and maybe i'm missing something in my uh my uh, toolbox of, of things that i know and i need to go back and uh, reevaluate. so i think it's a very useful card altogether this, so much this, this is card. perfect. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I just wanted to say it is one of these cards that has so much. There's so much to talk about on the Wind Fortune card. But yes, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's a it's a perfect card for even this episode of love, right? This is what the Wheel Fortune card is is symbolizing. It's symbolizing the law of love. Um, even where you see the T A R O T, right? It's spelling tarot. And then it has the, the Hebrew okay. as well. So um, it's it's saying the wheel of tarot. Um, uh, the wheel of tarot. I'm going off memory. I'm not actually reading uh, what it represents. Um, but it's it's speaking. Let's see if you have it in your notes. The law of Har Hathor. Um, so it's just talking about the wheel of life natural law this is what it's symbolizing you have the sphinx on the top as well which the sphinx um is a feminine deity that represents she's the protector she's the guardian of the mystery so the mystery my story the mystery of nature um and then i find it you know synchronistic that every one of the the directions um, in the corners, those represent northeast, southwest as well. Uh, also represents the seasons that they each have a book. Libre. Liberty. So it's pretty it's pretty cool. It's a fascinating card. I love it. Yeah. What is that um sort of uh dog like symbol on the bottom that seems to be stretched over? What is that? It's a represent? wolf. A wolf. Oh, I'm sorry. It, it's a fox. Fox. Yeah. A red fox. What what do you think that represents? Um, um I, I what I think I could be wrong, but I'm trying to go off memory. I think that is a um a fox, it, it's kind of subversion. So you have the Sphinx, which is the guardian of the mysteries, and then you have the the fox. It could be it looked at as a wolf. Um is more of the kind of the deception that is at play that could be the falsities the false prophets this kind of mm -hmm. stuff the false knowledge mm -hmm. um the serpent obviously representing the the process of higher awareness and consciousness mm -hmm. as well so that's so the beautiful thing about tarot is that mm -hmm. you know e even that serpent how it's 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 going downwards has a meaning as well right everything on these cards um especially like the rider weight deck and some of the the more um older decks just have so much symbolism and meaning to them it's it's fascinating i'm really glad that we're discussing these things because during my new age phase i learned tarot but i i was using other decks because at the time i was also going through my emotional learning and i was just feeling triggered by the cards to where I, I didn't feel like I could receive the messages so much. Um, so I just learned to read on other decks and that had same meanings, but um, 
not not the same symbolism. So it might be fun to revisit the original Rider Waite deck. For sure. Yeah. For me. I was turn you on. I know I talked about it last episode, maybe the one before too, to Michael Cesarion's Path of the Fool series. Um it's so incredible and and he he really he I mean it's hours. I couldn't even tell you. Each episode on each card is two or three hours long and it's just an incredible yeah. thing. Something yeah, that has been together when we're driving, that's all we listen to is Path of the Fool. So it, it it's um it's amazing. I'm gonna send a link. Oh, I awesome. promise. <laughs> I will That's receive fantastic. it. It's a great, it's a great video. Like I've watched it a couple of times too. And um, I always appreciate the Rider Wake deck. It's really the only one I use um, because it really is just like a totally crazy book. <laughs> and each card you go through it and like I pick, I can, I can see it. Well, I can, I can see everything that's in there and I can see like every time I go back to it, I can see a little bit more and I can see the context. But I think also that comes with like the more you kind of work with it, not just like memorizing a bunch of meanings or whatever. You got to kind of use some, there's like the historical symbolism, the value we've given our esoteric knowledge over many, many millennia, whatever it is. Um, eventually coming into the form of a deck of cards like this as how I see it. I, I think this stuff was always out there. And just by design of, you know, survival, perhaps, you know, that was source or whatever, pushing whoever into a direction to go this way or that way to protect the information and make sure it's still in the world. And I think the tarot is something that came from that. But um Every time I, I I look at the deck and I'm looking at the cards, I'm kind of experiencing a little bit of something new. Um, so yeah, I just I wanted to bring up the wheel of tarot, the wheel of fortune, because I just thought it was very interesting with how I think this card coincides with this piece. Mm. And I think it's it's quite a nice connection. I, I think if you're looking, you could it, you could see this and maybe a lot of you could see the muses in this. Um, you could see um, a lot of, you know, you could see the eight of pentacles um, in it. I mean, I think like whoever the girl who drew this, I think, had some knowledge base. So it's a beautiful picture. I'll, I'll be sure to leave the link in the description. Uh, there, one last so, thing. I think that it's card number 10. Um, and so where the hermit is card number nine, so we come from this singular self to then like the double digit, um, almost you could think duality too. I just wanted to yeah. point that out too, that you, we come into this like new, it's, it's, that's all. <laughs> and I think yeah. this, this painting or, or drawing really shows this like from death to rebirth, you know, that this season is, uh, that this you know, represented in this transformation of the dark fire, like burned trees to this brand new growth and and life force bursting through, you know, with the fire yeah. of hope. It's a very hopeful, like powerful image. Yeah. Um, so are there any thoughts about that before we move on to our last little bit? No, that was lovely. Yeah, that was excellent. Okay. So I I always like to do a little bit of history because I think when we understand our history, we have a far better chance of not only just understanding things and but being able to take in things. It's difficult to I I I think that it's difficult for a lot of people to take in new information if they don't understand our history and um, I've even had people in the past tell me, Oh, there's, you know, history is what people think it is, or there's no truth, you know? So I'm like, but there's no real history of like, like that you can't find any truth in history. I'm like, so how do you think you exist? I don't understand this <laughs> concept, but um, I kind of get that a lot, especially on the internet. So um, but I wanted to go through a little bit of history um, 
And then you can let me know what you guys think about it and what maybe you might know from your own knowledge toolbox. The earliest story we have on Valentine's Day is the pagan holiday Lupercalia. This occurred for centuries in the middle of February to celebrate fertility. Men would strip naked and sacrifice a goat or dog. Young boys would then take strips of hide from the sacrificed animals and use it to whip young women in order to promote fertility. Lupercalia, also <laughs> known as Lupercal, I don't know if I'm pronouncing any of that right, was a pastoral festival of ancient Rome observed annually from February 13th through 15th to purify the city, promoting health and fertility. Lupercalia was also known as, as it's probably a typo on my part, sorry. Februatus. <laughs> After the purification instruments called Februa, the basis, so there were tools involved, the basis for the month named Februaris. Unlike Valentine's Day, however, Lupercalia was a bloody, violent, and sexually charged celebration. Awash with animal sacrifice, random matchmaking, and coupling in the hopes of warding off evil spirits and infertility. Pope Gal Galatius I outlawed the festival during his pontificate between 492 and 496. Traditionally, many believe that other Christian holidays in February, like Candlemas or Valentine's Day, replaced Lupercalia. So that was just some history I, I pulled up. Mm -hmm. So um, any thoughts on any of that, guys? I'm just yeah. glad that we okay. live now and we in this modern age. <laughs> <laughs> and can you imagine? I can... In today's world, you just get like all the women turning around and beating them half senseless <laughs> to make them just more fertile. <laughs> it's like be fertile, goddammit. <laughs> funny. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> well, you know, one one uh, practice or event they would do at um, Lupercalia is that they would take um, goat hides. And they would turn them into whips. And then even the whips had like little spikes on them, like little thorns. And they would whip men, would whip women. And supposedly it aroused the women. And that was also part of the festival, along with the lottery, right? From February 13th to 15th, they would draw a name. You would be, you would be with that, that person uh, for the whole festival. A lot of times... Um, it would turn into actual an actual relationship or marriage. This is the reason why um, uh, Glacius outlawed um, the festival for a time period is because the Roman uh, in the military, you, you had to be single. You couldn't be married. And marriage was getting an uptick from this festival as well. So that was one of the main reasons why he outlawed it. Then you have the bishop or the priest Valentinus, and this is, you know, a, a, where the name Valentine's Day comes from. They, you know, they did a martyr for this, uh, this bishop, but supposedly he was marrying people in secret. He got arrested. He was tortured. He actually, uh, one of the jailer, the jailer's guard, uh, the guard had a daughter, and supposedly she was blind, and he cured her blindness and gave her a note and they were able to prove that she was cured because she was a she read the note with her fresh you know new sight and it said from your valentine um so again Very interesting wow yeah and something to keep in mind like you were saying sarah i think that's important um there's fragments of history there's going to be you know some that are you know, correct in truth, and there's going to be deception, there's going to be falsities. You got to take it as a grain of salt. Most of the, and this goes from all the majority of, of pagan history, it's very um, influenced by Christianity and Catholicism, 
meaning that's where the literature comes from and that's where we kind of get our resources in many cases and in and especially with holidays um so valentine's yeah. day yep so yep. take the report with a with a little bit of salt because it's through the christian lens and they may be may have exaggerated certain aspects of barbarianism so to speak right you know? well yeah yeah that and, absolutely. and the martyr right the holidays are usually centered around you know a magical martyr a saint and saint or valentinus you know supposedly lived for multiple centuries it's like come on um it, it wasn't until about the fifth century where they actually established the christian holiday as um you know valentine's day yeah um, so so yeah I, so i i try to always look at the history because it gives me a clearer perspective so try to encourage this and in, in everybody but to understand that because we live in this you know we live in a global human society so we have to take an account that there are going to be people who write history maybe not necessarily not telling the truth you know but it's like fragments of the truth but it may be that's what they think is real or it's their perspective or it's uh, um or it's something corrupted or whatever but you, you gotta go into any kind of historical research by understanding that you have to use the tool of discernment when figuring out what you have to judge you have to make the you have to judge your you, you have to trust your own internal compass when it comes to making proper judgment discernment mm -hmm. on what sounds like what has that ring of truth mm -hmm. when you're reading history and what goes well that sounds like you know mm -hmm. crap or nonsense or you know it sounds like um you know people bringing in their own beliefs or perspectives in it instead of just laying to the hard facts which is which is why I kind of end up liking all the kind of seminars where it's just the hard facts like just give me the information I don't need to know how it makes you feel just yeah give me the information I, and I think that compass analogy is really good and it corresponds to the wheel of fortune too and through knowledge through the studying and the yeah. consideration of all elements right mm -hmm. and um the care of the sphinx right then you can develop your discernment of where you are mm -hmm. you know where are you in, in in the compass is a way to figure out where you are and how to get where you want to go yeah it's yeah. it's a knowledge based card and um i i i covered this information with um brendan spencer with uh when we talked about leonardo da vinci and he leonardo da vinci studied the vitruvian man and that was all about i mean that he didn't invent that a lot of people think he invented that but he didn't it actually came from vitruvius um before him but um it's all the maturity man is all him trying to explain scientifically in the physical realm, the microcosm and the micro um, macrocosm and how, um, I mean, it, it's really a new creation of, of the wheel of fortune. It's, it's basically trying to tell you the same things. So it's, it's a very interesting correlation, I think. And uh, it really does come down to that. And you've got to, with the topic mm -hmm. of love you've got to have that in the microcosm mm -hmm. and in the the microcosm you know both they mm -hmm. both have to come together so yeah well Excellent. said well said yeah we, we see have... we see some common attributes um with this with valentine's day and you know even lupercalia right a festival for fertility and purification mm -hmm which looking at the in bulk imagery, right? Fire, this is what fire represents purification. Even in, um, where was it? I think it's China. Yeah, China, they have a 2000 year old festival as well. And it was for fertility and purification um, around this same time period. So it's just fascinating uh, that we can see, you know, in different parts of the world, but still common similar attributes 
that are rooted in nature and the cycles of nature. Yeah. Yeah. Well, give a plug for your recent um, radio podcast you did with Crypt Rec on the holidays. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, myself and Logan Hart went on to Crypt Rick's I've Been Thinking show on Revolution Radio. Mm -hmm. um, I did put a copy up on my my website, willkeller.com, and we dove into, you know, the, the pagan origins or the origins of Valentine's Day uh, in detail. And it had a whole bunch of other topics mm -hmm. that we kind of covered. It's really cool. I think it's going to be a series because we also did Halloween, which mm -hmm. came out really well. Um, so we got mm -hmm. St. Patrick's Day, which we're going to blast on and then um of course spring and, and future holidays as well awesome very fun yeah. Yeah. i watched both of those and i can say um to any viewers out there go and check out the halloween mm -hmm. and the valentine's day special that um will and logan and crook rick because you were on you three were both of those right it was that's correct three of you and they were both very good because they talked about history they talked about um how people interact with this stuff today um how they did it in the past and what it what it means and how to go forward so both very very good interviews and go and check it out yeah well said yeah. thanks for for joining us too well i think we're kind of winding down and really appreciated your input and, you, and what you have to offer yeah mm. i had a blast so Lovely. Thank you for having me on. All you ladies, thank, appreciate it. Thank you for coming, Will. The sun has set in Kansas City. I'm sorry I'm in dark. <laughs> I know. In dark I'm not city. far. I'm like two hours away, and we have terrible lighting in the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been fun. Thank you, Sarah, for facilitating and, and yeah. being the um, really the holder of the fire of this project. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Thank Thank you guys for coming and joining me every month. Thank you, Will, for coming and <clears throat> doing our February talk with us. Um, hopefully this will continue and we will have a new video up next month. Um, uh, they usually come out about the middle or the end of each month after we record them. So um, thank you everybody for coming and thank you for watching and um, go and check out the one great network.com go check out willkeller.com and go check out leslie's website uh alive thrive dot life yeah although, and although i'll say my website is giving me trouble and up uh uploading so you can see a more complete um amount of my work on the one great work network or um on uh youtube or odyssey i have channels yeah. so. Yeah. So thank you guys so much again for another great episode. I really appreciate it. And until um, next time, I love you, homies. Yeah. Take it easy. Yeah. I'll go pay. Thank you guys. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye bye. <laughs>